Question 5 then from the 2009 Higher Paper 2. There are two graphs shown here, two trig graphs. It gives you the equation of the first one, which you could see for yourself anyway. It's a cosine because it doesn't start in its middle. It's starting at one of the extremities. In fact, it's starting down below, so it must be a negative of a cosine. Its amplitude isn't 1 because it's not simply going up and down 1. It's going from 7 to negative 1. That's a difference of 8 which means the amplitude's half of that, 4 up, 4 down. So negative 4 is the amplitude. It completes one wavelength by pi. That's only halfway through a complete cycle. It would take two wavelengths to reach 2 pi. So it's got a frequency of 2, two complete wavelengths. And with an amplitude 4, it's not simply going up 4 and down 4. It's been shifted up so that instead of topping at 4, it's gone to 7. So it's all been shifted up 3. The top should have been at 4, it's up at 7. The bottom part should have been at negative 4, it's lifted up 3 to negative 1. That was that part of it, but that was stated. We'll just do a similar thing with this blue graph here. The function g of x is also a cosine because it doesn't start in its middle. It states that anyway. It's the correct way around, starting at the top, so it's a positive. And this one is centred properly on the x-axis. It's going up 3 and it's going down 3. That means that... The amplitude is 3, and the same as with the first graph, it's gone through a complete wavelength by pi, so it would take two wavelengths to get to 2 pi. So that means that n equals 2, a frequency of 2. Well, that was part A, so for part B, find correct one decimal place the coordinates of the point of intersection. Well, now that I know my two equations, I'll just state the second one again here formally. g of x equals 3 cos 2x. That means at an intersection, I can equate the two graphs. I've got y equals this and y equals that, so the two parts should be equal. At the intersection, I'll say that requires that g of x will give the same answer as f of x. So that 3 cos 2x, I think I'll dispense with the brackets at this point, would equal negative 4 cos of 2x plus 3. Now they may well have 2x in them. It doesn't make them double angle equations because they're both the same. There's only one type of angle present in both of these terms. I can simply take those two parts together, bringing the negative 4 over, will give me 7 of these same things, the cos of 2x. I wouldn't have been able to do that if that was 2x and that was single x then it would have been the double angle equation equals 3 and then there you go you can solve that linearly because there's only one mention of x when there's only one mention of x you just get rid of all the bits of pieces until you've dug down and got to it so the first thing to do is get rid of that 7 there was a multiplying 7 so that will divide the other side now get rid of the cos to get rid of cos, I'll do the inverse again on the other side. So it'll be the inverse cos of 3 sevenths. And now I've got a choice. Am I going to do it in degrees? Or am I going to do it in radians? Well, the answer's meant to be in radians. You can either do it in degrees and then change your answer into radians, or you could just be brave and set your calculator to radians. So with the calculator set into radians, the little R is indicating the top. I just want inverse cos of 3 sevenths. And that comes out 1.127. Just check again with all sine tan cos, the cast diagram, to make sure I'm having the right place. The cosine is positive, so it's that angle is either in the first quadrant or in the second quadrant. That angle being 1.12, I'll round it off to 128 radians. Remembering that if I'm dealing with radians, it won't be 0 to 180, it'll be 0 to pi, and that 0 will also be 2 pi. So my two angles will either be, I go around, as it says, 1.128 radians, or I go round all the way to here, which is 1.128 short of 2 pi. I'll just take a note, so it's 2 pi minus 1.128. Now, I can't leave that as an exact form because that wasn't exact. So I'll just have to type that in. And I get 5.155. So there's my two answers. 1.128 or 
155. Last thing is, divide by that 2. So to find the x coordinates of points, it'll be halving those. 0 0.564, 2.5775, I'll put it, put it up to 8. But it did say the coordinates, so I'll need the y coordinates. So I'll need to feed those into either of those two. Probably just put them into g. So if x equals that, that means y is going to be 3 cos. And notice it is, it's 2 times it. That was the original there then. So I can either write 2 times it or just go back up to 2 times it. 1.128. Same with this one. y equals 3 cos. I can either say 2 times the x, but that will just take me back up to 5.155. I know I've lost a few decimal places here. Then it's just press a few more buttons and we're there. <coughs> giving me 1.2854, just leave it at that, and <coughs> 1 point, obviously, 285. Must be the same answer, because it's such a symmetrical graph. They're at the same height, and that was handy because it checked that part of it. And then state the coordinates somewhere. Now, for the points of intersection, it said they only wanted them to one decimal place. Ha! <laughs> Cheapskates. So, putting them down neatly, I'd have, for the first point of intersection, that would be 0 0.6, and the y-coordinate would be 1.3, and the second one would be 2.6, and the y-coordinate, obviously, is again 1.3. Of course, when you're working out the answers, you don't shorten them all just to one decimal place, first of all. Keep the accuracy going until you get to the end, and then round it off. Part C then, calculate the shaded area. Now, I know it's not shaded in, but it means the area enclosed between the two graphs. When you calculate an area, you're actually adding up lots of thin strips working out the areas of these little rectangles. Those rectangles looking like this, where the length of that rectangle must be the y-coordinate of the top, given by this equation, take away the y-coordinate at the bottom, given by that equation. And it doesn't matter where the x-axis is, it'll simply be subtract the two coordinates. Positive something, take away a negative something, of course, increases it to the sum of those two lengths. It's that length times its width dx. So the area is given by the integral, which is of course that elongated s for the summation of all of those. From where do you want to start doing it? Oh, this will do fine, 0 0.6. Keep adding them up until they get to where? This point here, 2.6. Of the heights of those strips, well that will be the top take away the bottom. Well the top was negative 4 cos 2x plus 3 and the bottom part was negative, sorry, take away 3 cos 2x. Now I know I've already put those two parts together in the evaluation of the points of intersection because that involved the subtraction. I need to do this just to make sure I don't get it the wrong way around because one thing you don't want to be doing is have them the wrong way around, which may well have happened in that equation that you formed to get the points of intersection. Numerically, yes, it'll be the same. The difference will be, if you have them the wrong way around, the area will turn out, this integral rather, will turn out to be negative, and you don't want to write down equals negative whatever it happens to be, negative 10. Oh, it must be positive, and then say negative 10 equals 10. That won't work. You'd have to make some other statement like, oops, must have done it upside down. But since it's an area, it has to be positive. But you don't want to be doing that. Just get it down properly to begin with. Top, take away bottom. That represents the top, take away bottom is the height of the strip. The width of the strip, dx. Now I can tidy this up. It's the integral from 0.6 to 2.6. And notice this time, it's going to be negative 7 cos 2x plus 3. Not the way you might have had it, 7 2x minus 3. That's that dx. Now it's ready to go. I can integrate cos quite easily, and it's acting on not just x, unfortunately, but at least it's a linear function. Don't forget to divide by the derivative of the inside. 
So cos, well cos must go back to sine. Sine would have produced a cos, so it must be a negative sine. So I've still got negative 7 sine. It was acting on 2x. What's the derivative of 2x? 2. So I need to divide by 2. Sorry, it's sitting up in 2. 3, we'll go back up to x. Evaluate all of that from 0.6 to 2.6. I've got negative 7 upon 2 sine of twice x. I suppose I could put the substitution in first. 2 times 2.6 plus 3 times just x, 2.6. And from that, subtract negative 7 upon 2, sine of 2 times 0 0.6. Adding on 3 times 0 0.6. Now, it's just a big pile of arithmetic. So, typing this in, again, it depends. Will I just use this approximate value, which only had one decimal place, or will I go back to the original? I'm supposing I'm just going to use this one decimal place because that's all they asked for, so this answer won't actually be as accurate as the real area. Still, that's what they said. So, this part gives me 3.092, so I'll just leave it at 9, and that part, of course, is going to be 7.8. Minus, now doing this part, gives me negative 3.26, just to two decimal places, I can't really justify more when I've only got one decimal place that I'm putting into it. Plus three times it will be 1.8. And then just put it all together. Remember it's going to be plus the 3.26 and minus the 1.8. And I get 12.35 units squared. Allowing for all the variations in rounding off that you may have done at various stages.